Well, we're not completely free. We're subject to the laws of physics and the laws of biology. Uh, our bodies wear down. We need nutrition. We're vulnerable to all kinds of environmental insults. We are, our ability to behave depends on the structure of the brain that we're, we're born with and the culture that we're embedded in. Uh, on the other hand, we're free, certainly free in the sense that uh, one couldn't predict anyone's behavior down to the last choice, even knowing everything about his parentage and uh, culture and individual history. Uh, and there's uh, an enormous scope for the brain to uh, craft new forms of behavior uh, in response to the person's particular situation and perhaps in response to random factors that, uh, that we don't understand. Well, certainly people can uh, control their own behavior. That's what our big prefrontal cortex is for. We respond to incentives. That's why uh, you generally get more peace and order when there's uh, good government than in a state of anarchy. Why people do everything from um, not park in uh, no parking zones if they think they'll get a ticket to refrain from uh, killing people that they're jealous about or, or uh, angry at. Uh, we can control our behavior. Uh, we can seek to improve ourselves. We can learn more. We can uh, apply uh, mental discipline to avoid temptation, to refine our own ability to, to uh, reason. On the other hand, we not everyone can do everything. I don't have any illusions that with any amount of practice I could uh, be as good a uh, physicist as Richard Feynman or as good a basketball player as Michael Jordan. Uh, part of wisdom is knowing what the scope is of your own room for improvement and uh, discipline. It's uh, equally foolish to think that nature and culture give you no options and to just be fatalistic about your prospects in life or to imagine that you could do anything that you set your mind to. A part of the wisdom of being an adult is knowing what the uh, fences are on both sides of the range in which you can uh, improve or change yourself. I think people, mature people, recognize that they have a certain temperament and a certain cognitive style. Some people are more lighthearted, uh, others are more morose. Some people are apt to be conservative in their outlook, others uh, looser. I think part of uh, being a, 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 a wise and mature individual is to recognize your own quirks and, and uh, traits, to discount them when you're trying to arrive at an objective uh, appraisal of events. Realize, well, I would think that, given that I'm by temperament conservative or by temperament uh, an anarchist, and try to see reality objectively, uh, subtracting out your own biases. When it comes to choices uh, of how to live your life, then there many are areas in which you want to indulge your own temperament. Uh, you don't want to continually put yourself in situations that will just make you uh, grumpy or anxious uh, if there's no ulterior benefit to forcing yourself to do what you don't, uh, uh, what you aren't otherwise inclined to do. We have, we have every reason to believe that genes matter in terms of a person's temperament or outlook. Identical twins that were separated at birth, for example, who share all of their genes but uh, not their environment, tend to be correlated in uh, political attitudes. That is, to some extent, your tendency to be liberal or conservative seems to be uh, affected by your genes. Degree of religiosity, not whether you'll believe in Jesus or Buddha or uh, one God or many gods, but the extent to which spiritual experiences are an important part of your life and you're likely to, to uh, engage in, in religious practice and belief, uh, that has a heritable component. Uh, 
uh, intelligence has a, a heritable component. Uh, personality, whether you're uh, anxious or calm, uh, open to experience or more uh, timid, whether you're conscientious or more aggressive uh, and irresponsible, all of those have some degree of um, susceptibility to influence from our genes. Now, in no case is the influence 100%. There are always uh, differences, say, between identical twins, even brought up in the same home who share both their genes and their environment, which suggests that there are influences on personality and temperament and intelligence that are not genetic and perhaps not cultural either. There may be idiosyncratic quirks that shape the development of the brain in utero or in the first few years of life that also go into what makes us what we are. Uh, but certainly the uh, effect of the genes can, cannot be negated. By now we have many sources of evidence from studies of twins, from studies of adoptees, that show that genes probabilistically matter. People use the word human nature to refer to the uh, characteristic ways of uh, experiencing emotion, of uh, having motives and drives, of uh, categorizing and reasoning about the world that are common to all members of Homo sapiens. The fact that humans uh, speak, the fact that we uh, remember, often not very accurately, that we uh, judge probabilities also with systematic biases, that we fall in love, that we experience fear, and indeed fear of particular uh, kinds of objects and experiences like heights, predatory animals, darkness, venomous snakes and spiders, uh, social scrutiny. Uh, we get angry when uh, uh, we feel that someone else hasn't taken our welfare into account. Uh, we, we trust people. We feel grateful when they do us favors. We feel uh, uh, angry when favors are withhold, withheld from us. We feel sympathy to people in need. Uh, we categorize and label our experiences. We think that living things have uh, an internal essence that uh, gives them their form. We think that other people have minds that uh, govern their behavior and their thoughts and feelings. Uh, we think that physical objects continue to exist when you don't look at them. Those are just some of the many psychological traits that collectively make up human nature. Uh, I think that uh, uh, understanding ourselves is a prerequisite to just about everything that's, that's uh, valuable in life, to uh, enlightenment, to cooperation, to uh, escape from the self-deception that mires us in uh, conflict and argument. Chekhov once said, man will be better when you can show him what he is like. And as a psychologist, I think those are, are words to live by. And part of understanding uh, what makes us tick is understanding the forces that, uh, that, that organized us, that put us together, that gave us our design. And that means that ultimately we, we have to look to evolution as part of the uh, solution to who we are. The human brain is a highly non-random uh, piece of biological machinery. It, doesn't learn to do everything equally easily. It does some things without ha having to learn anything. To understand why it works the way it does, uh, we have to know something about the forces that shaped it. And that means the, an understanding of the ecological niche that our species evolved in, the strategies that our ancestors used to make a living in that environment, uh, as a way to figure out why we're uh, built the way we are. Uh, ed educating someone uh, enhances the cognitive tools that you need to determine what is true or false or sound or un unsound. Uh, it consists of uh, facts about how the world works and what happened in human history that, uh, that are generally agreed upon. Uh, more importantly, it includes 
ability to think critically, to examine arguments, to recognize fallacies in reasoning, including the kind of fallacies that the human brain makes us vulnerable to, uh, to make finer distinctions, to um, sharpen uh, analyses. All of these are very different from indoctrination, where it's a, a matter of enforcing particular beliefs or ideologies on people as opposed to allowing them to test and verify them for themselves. Even when it comes to, uh, to, to facts, scientific or historical facts, what an education should equip you to do is to understand how those facts could have been, uh, were discovered, what could lead them to be falsified, and the ability to satisfy yourself that they really are facts as opposed to taking them on authority. In the case of science, it means understanding the experiments that led to a particular conclusion or, the, or field observations. In the case of mathematics, it's being able to retrace the proofs. In the case of history, it's being able to uh, evaluate the physical and documentary evidence that led historians to come to some conclusion. Now, no one has enough time to track down every uh, justification for every fact. If historians tell me that uh, the Normans invaded England in 1066, I'm pretty much going to take their word for it. Uh, if scientists tell me that uh, fossils are uh, 550 million years old, uh, I probably won't learn everything that I would really need to know in stratigraphy and dating and geology and so on to verify it for myself. But if I ever wanted to, I could. Uh, I would know what kinds of uh, chains of reasoning led scientists or historians to their conclusion. And if I was skeptical about any one of them, I could check for myself. I believe that most historians and scientists and, and uh, other scholars have established enough of a track record so that even for those claims that I don't bother to go out and check, uh, I, I trust them and generally that trust is repaid in the areas where I am skeptical. But the point of education and the point of scholarship is that there's ultimately nothing that has to be taken on faith. Anything that you take tentatively uh, as, a, as a belief is simply because of the trust earned by the scholarly establishment as a whole, but individually any fact can be questioned and its uh, basis in uh, evidence examined. I think indoctrination takes advantage of uh, certain traits of human nature that we would do well to identify and understand. One of them is self-serving biases. People like to believe things that put them or the group they belong to in a good light. Everyone thinks they're on the side of the angels. Uh, realizing that, that uh, you are apt to think better of yourself and your gender and your religion and, uh, and, and nation than you ought to is the first step towards uh, getting an objective assessment of what you and your group are, are like. There's reason to think that our self-serving biases and our self-deception uh, may not be a bug as far as evolution was concerned, but a feature, something that uh, it might pay to have for certain purposes. In particular, uh, people uh, are often in a situation in which they can get an advantage by distorting the truth uh, in their direction, by portraying themselves as <clears throat> more honest, more trustworthy, wiser, more knowledgeable, more objective than we really are. Now, that will only make other people skeptical of our claims to uh, uh, wisdom and generosity. And the question is, how do you persuade other skeptics that you are as wise and uh, generous as you are selling yourself as? Well, if there's a kind of arms race between deceivers and lie detectors, uh, then, and if any twitch or inconsistency or a bit of nervousness can give you away, uh, 
The most effective way of persuading a, uh, a skeptic is to believe your own lies. The best salesman is the one who believes in the product. The best liar is the one who believes his own lies. Because if you believe that you are infinitely wise and patient and knowledgeable and generous sincerely, uh, you're not lying and therefore you can't give yourself away by your lies. The problem, of course, is that when everyone uh, is built that way, there's apt to be human uh, conflict and, uh, and argument uh, where two opposing sides sincerely believe that they're in the right and that the other person is just impervious to argument or is self-serving. I think it's uh, a source of, uh, of great tragedy that we're apt to believe our own self-serving story to sincerely believe that we are seeing the world as it is and that other people are deluded or uh, dishonest or impervious to reason. And you can have two people sincerely believing uh, opposing views about themselves and the other side. Uh, evolution is descent with modification, the fact that organisms, uh, a lineage of organisms will change over time. Natural selection is the most important mechanism of evolution. It's not the only one because there are also uh, random factors in evolution, but natural selection is the process that gives rise to the appearance of design, to eyes that see and wings that fly and uh, arms that grasp, all the kinds of uh, illusions of engineering that so impress us about living things. The way that natural selection works is uh, that it's a process that is kicked off by replication. You've got to have some kind of system that can make a copy of itself, including the ability of the copies to make copies of themselves. When that happens, you'll have an exponential uh, explosion in the number of descendants. No finite environment can support an exponentially growing number of, uh, <coughs> of gadgets. They'll inevitably compete for the raw materials to build the copies and for the energy to power the replication. Uh, since no copying process is perfect, uh, copying errors will inevitably crop up. If any of those errors by chance increases the rate of replication, it will, over a very small number of generations, crowd out its competitors. As that process is iterated over many generations of copying and uh, occasional errors, the population will come to be predominated by replicators that look as if they've been engineered toward uh, efficient replication, but in fact have simply accumulated all of the copying errors that made them more effective replicators. That process, when we see it backwards, when we look through the wrong end of the telescope uh, and look back from, from the present, uh, is, uh, gives rise to what we see today as design, but which in fact was just differential replication of uh, replicants with copying errors. I think there's a lot of reason to believe that the idea that there is a unified self, uh, a single I that's in control of our entire minds, is something of an illusion. That there can be multiple selves that are uh, operating uh, simultaneously. Uh, we, there are some clever experiments that show that when people uh, are distracted, they will often be more objective about their own generosity and ability than when they can set their mind to it, suggesting that, the, uh, that there is an unconscious thought process that uh, has an accurate view of the self, but then there's a, a spin doctor or an advertising uh, executive pushing that unconscious uh, voice down so that it's damaging insights don't leak out to the disadvantage of the entire person. And we know from neuroscience there are other ways in which there are multiple selves. The, the two cerebral hemispheres, to some extent, uh, operate independently and shunt information back and forth across the corpus callosum. 
the cortex and some of the subcortical structures are each doing their own thing and talking to each other in the intact uh, human. Uh, different parts of the cortex are processing information in parallel. Uh, we, there are, are mechanisms that harmonize the different parts of the brain when we act. It's not as if the right leg wants to go in one direction and the left leg wants to go in another direction. Now, ultimately, they all have to be reconciled. But uh, inside the skull, we have every reason to believe that there are uh, many selves uh, all thinking and wanting at the same time. Um, I think any explanation of uh, what makes us tick has to take place at several levels. We have to understand the flow of information in the mind, what uh, representations of the visual world, of language, uh, of emotions are active and how they exchange information. We have to know how it's all implemented in uh, neural tissue, and we have to know uh, the evolutionary forces that um, explain why uh, the brain is the way it is, as opposed to some other way it could have been. Uh, there wasn't any cosmic engineer or designer who wired the brain up according to some uh, explicit plan, but the process of evolution uh, implicitly organized the brain to do some things better than others, and that explains why, say, of uh, various intelligent de devices that we're familiar with, computers and cameras and, and human brains, Brains are very good at doing certain things that computers are bad at, like recognizing faces, or digesting the gist of a story, or controlling arms and legs. And computers are good at doing things that brains are bad at, like multiplying five-digit numbers. Uh, evolution is the uh, source of answers to the question of why the brain is good at some things and bad at other things, and I think the ultimate source of, of uh, the answers to questions about uh, why there are certain uh, quirks, why there are certain biases, why there are certain desires that we have, desires for food and sex and safety and, and uh, esteem and <clears throat> knowledge that organize the brain to seek out certain goals and not others. Um, evolution is the uh, ultimate source of those kinds of constraints on the operation of the brain. Oh, there's enormous room for uh, improvement in the human condition. There are uh, vast parts of the world that have uh, only begun to tap the mechanisms of wealth creation that we've enjoyed in the West. Uh, vast parts of the world that haven't begun to enjoy the uh, levels of, of uh, freedom that we've had in the West. And needless to say, there's lots of improvement that the West itself can and ought, ought to do. There are, um, we have, no one can reasonably predict what gifts technology can uh, uh, deliver to us in the, in the future. Uh, and it's, we desperately need technological advances that will generate energy more cleanly, uh, that will grow food more uh, efficiently that will lengthen human lifespans. Uh, and um, <clears throat> uh, just as uh, 100 years ago, no one could have predicted some of the huge advances in, in uh, well-being that we've enjoyed, I don't think that we can predict uh, the potential uh, for, for what our children and grandchildren might enjoy. And of course, we have uh, the, the challenge, not just of trying to make life better, but to prevent it from getting a lot worse, which uh, of course could happen if we don't deal with problems like global climate change, energy sh shortages, new pandemics, uh, <clears throat> increased in, uh, increases in population, decreases in available water, and many challenges that if we do nothing, will make the state of the world a lot worse.